I love the concept of an elevator pitch. It's a fantastic mental exercise for you as a founder and one that is very commonly overlooked. So what is an elevator pitch? It's a short description of an idea, product, or company. It's meant to be shorter than an elevator ride, hence the name, meaning 30 seconds or so. The concept also applies to pitching yourself, you know, as an individual, kind of to introduce yourself and to land a job, but we'll be focusing on the company slash startup version of this. An elevator pitch should be enough to explain your startup idea or the product that you're selling and leave that investor curious for more. Now, this is not to be confused with the concept of a pitch deck. What is a pitch deck? That's a 10 to 15 slide presentation to introduce a business proposal mostly associated these days with an investor pitch deck. If you're looking for that, we have a couple of videos focusing on pitch decks, as well as a neat pitch deck template, which you will find in the description. So back to the elevator version. In this video, we're gonna look into some tactics to approach writing your elevator pitch and some lessons learned. Then I'll take a stab at writing some elevator pitch examples from companies that you're probably familiar with. So this is elevator pitch examples for startups. Let me give you my elevator pitch first, and then we'll break it down. Do you ever need to make slide presentations? I'm gonna assume you said yes. And how long does it usually take you? Insert any answer here, it's probably gonna be hours. So we discovered that the reason why it takes so long is that all presentation platforms give you this white canvas and you need to figure out what content to put in there and how it's gonna look all at the same time. And this is just very inefficient. And if you're not a designer, your slides might not look too good. So we created Slidebean, a tool where all you need to do is add the content and then the design of the slides gets generated automatically. And over 10 million slides have been created with our platform. So here's a quick teardown of some of the stuff I did. First up, starting with a question. So we have the advantage of tackling a problem that most people in an office have experienced. We can bet that the answer to the first question will be yes, and that the answer of the second question will be a long time. The question also allows you to turn this into a controlled conversation rather than just a one-way pitch. The focus here is to be relatable, to speak to a problem that the potential customer or potential investor will have experienced. Not all companies can get away with this, but try to find something that applies to your business. On the other hand, we had some challenges. For example, Slidebean is visual. It's a lot easier for me to just show you how it works, but I can't do that in the elevator. Amount of details. Now, notice how I mostly focused on this problem-solution combination. This is what an elevator pitch is mainly made up of. It's a teaser of the company, enough to get people interested. Next up, no jargon. Notice how I didn't use any fancy terms that I often throw around like artificial intelligence, online collaboration, viewer tracking. Too many tech terms put together in 30 seconds or less just sound like jargon. Middle out is based on a completely new probabilistic model. It finds long range structure that's hidden even to domain optimized algorithms. I'm sorry, is, is this two in the weeds? Finally, a hint of traction. So you might or might not want to share details about customers and revenue, but showcasing a metric that gives a sense of the scale of the business is pretty useful for your credibility. Now, moving into elevator pitch examples. If you run a Google search for this term, you'll probably come across this video, hopefully. But beyond that, there are a bunch of articles from different sources showing some examples. And none of them really stood up. I actually read through most of them. And then I figured that we could imagine how the elevator pitches of some popular startups would have looked. So let's do Airbnb, for example. Again, let's assume that this is being pitched in 2009 with the information available on their original pitch deck, which I will link below. And we also made a video about it. So. We, Airbnb, connect travelers and real estate owners who want to... No, 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 wait. Remember, casual, no jargon, conversation-like. Let's go again. Most tourists booking online care about price, and hotels are one of the highest costs when traveling. On the other hand, platforms like Couchsurfing have proven that over half a million people are willing to lend their couches or their spare bedrooms. We, Airbnb, have created a platform that connects travelers with locals letting them rent out rooms or even entire places. Travelers save money and locals can monetize their empty rooms. And we just take a 10% commission. Now, how does that sound? A few pointers on, on how I approach this. Um, notice how I started mentioning tourists, not just any traveler. Airbnb doesn't necessarily target business travelers. It's easy to agree that people looking to travel care about price. So there's no market research or market validation needed to come up with that statement and not sound crazy. 
On the other hand, it might be arguable that people will be willing to rent out their homes to strangers. So I used the Couchsurfing validation to avoid that statement being questioned. Now let's do, let's do WeWork. Once again, this is based on the company stage they had by the time they made this pitch deck. Here we go. There are 40 million independent workers in the US, consultants, freelancers, small business owners, and solving office space is tough and expensive, especially in cities like New York. We, WeWork, we created the concept of space as a service. So we have 20 locations in the city where people can rent a desk or an office without any of the complications of a traditional lease, effectively saving them around 25% of the cost. So they get access to a shared front desk, mailroom, and a community of like-minded people. Finally, taking a stab at Slack. There is no publicly available pitch deck for Slack, but let's assume the company is just starting up. Here we go. So the average office worker receives around 304 business emails per week. And they also attend an average of 62 meetings per month. And over half of them, they consider a waste of time. So we made Slack to make work more efficient. So we organize conversations by channels and we drastically reduce the need for emails or meetings. We've also integrated with over 100 productivity tools like Google Docs and calendars or email, Dropbox, Zoom, so you can receive automatic notifications and take action without leaving the interface. I wrote these for a script, but if you have some better suggestions, go ahead and leave them in the comments. Two new features and changes for today's video compared to last week. First, I am totally out of t-shirts. I've used every single t-shirt on my closet and I can't keep up with our videos anymore. So I'm wearing Aviato today and I figured that I'd ask you guys for some starter swag. So if you ship me your starter tee, I'll wear it in one of my next videos and then you'll get your brand out there. How does that sound? Second, we're gonna start answering your questions at the end of each video. So feel free to drop them in the comments and we'll pick three and answer them every week. So here we go. Okay, first from David, um, can you please make a video of the details behind the operational costs of your company or any new IT company who is doing a web center app. Well, I actually made a video about that. Uh, it's the Slidebean financial model video and we'll, we'll, uh, the team will link it here in the description. So we actually shared uh, kind of like all of our expenses from the moment we started the company all the way to our first round of funding. Uh, we also have a good article on how we spend the first 250,000 bucks. So I think that those you'll find useful. And I think we covered most of that. We actually made the financial model public, so the actual Breakdown of expenses during that time, we made public, so you can go and download it there. Okay, so next up from Carlo Ledesma. Very valuable as usual, thanks a lot. <laughs> so would like to ask how startups can have a business continuity plan in case the founder is for whatever reason unable to work? Oh, that's a good question. Um, okay, a couple ideas there. I think vesting is very important. Um, we made a video about that. So, you know, founders, if, if you have multiple founders, um, you should define a vesting agreement in a way that if one founder leaves the company for whatever reason, it gets hit by a car even, uh, you know, all of his stock is only vested after he, sp he or she spent X amount of time with the company. Um, that protects the remaining founders and the company itself uh, in case that person leaves. If you don't do vesting, for example, and that you have a 50-50 split with founders, one of them, you know, you guys have a fight and one of them leave, and one of the founders leaves, um, you know, you're stuck with, that person who owns 50% of the company and you need to issue more stock if you want to get a new co-founder. So how do you manage that? Doing a vesting agreement helps solve that. So uh, normally it'll take four years for the full stock of a founder to be um, you know, to be actually issued to that founder. So if they leave early on, you have some protection. There's also founder's insurance. Um, I'm not that familiar with it. We don't have it. In a nutshell, it's an insurance that the company has in case the, the founder or the CEO or certain key people in the company are incapacitated. Again, we normally companies in a later stage get it. Uh, I understand that some investors in series A and series B request for the company to pay this founder insurance, you know, as a way to protect themselves. So it's not, you know, maybe they lose a very key person in the company, but they could, they get paid a few millions of dollars and then that, I guess, makes up for it. And then final question from uh, Rashim Sanford. Was just referred to Slidebean by a friend. That's a great friend you have there, man. I always want expected to have revenue before launching. Uh, no, you're not expected to have revenue before launching. You should launch, then have revenue. But the point is you should do that before raising money, which is what, what I talk about all the time. I, this, this really comes from experience and it's not a, I mean, it's not a hard rule. I've seen companies that raise money before revenue, before getting customers but it's just very hard. It's, it's very unlikely. I think 
I have this problem with Starter Press because they always make it look so easy. When you when you read about these companies that raise you know one two million dollars as a seed round and a company that you never heard of, a company that doesn't have a business model and they're you know they're they raise all this these crazy amounts of money, then you assume that that's something that you can do. Um, and it is, I guess, but it just happens very rarely. Uh, most companies raise money after getting some traction customers. Um, there's this amazing article, I've talked about it before, by Elizabeth Yin, who was one of our mentors at 500 Startups. Um, the article is called, uh, Should You Bootstrap or Should You Raise Money? I'll link it below. Um, and what she talks about is that, at least in Silicon Valley today, you know, this is 2018, but I guess it applies still 2019. Um, investors are looking for companies that have exponential growth. Uh, you need to be growing 30% month over month or so uh, if you want to get investors excited about this seed round. Before that, you are unlikely to be able to raise money. Her words, not mine. Um, and then what you can probably get away with is kind of like a friends and family sort of round. So, you know, assume that you can raise maybe $100,000, $200,000, which don't need a VC or an angel investor. That's something that you could hopefully raise between friends and, and, and close family or a very early investor that you know beforehand and that's willing to take a bigger risk in the company. But it's a different sort of relationship. It's not the VC meeting sort of relationship round that gets announced on TechCrunch, that sort of thing. It's, it's more like a quiet round with people that you know closely and that trust you. Um, you know, that's what you can get away with raising. Um, it, it's important that you define that. You know, the, there's 100, 200K that you can maybe raise pre-revenue. And then if you want to raise $500 million and so, it's very likely that you're going to need that traction. All right, so that's all for today. Remember to submit more questions in the comments. Here's that subscribe button for you so you can stay posted on our content. And here's that promo code. If you sign up with this code, you get three free months on any of our plans at Slipebean. Thanks a lot for watching. See you next week.